Dr. Rami, he is from, uh, he is uh, Egyptian Board uh, of Orthopedic Surgery, MS degree in Orthopedic Surgery, Banha University. Uh, he is uh, an expert in, the, in Orthopedic Surgery in Cairo uh, University. And he's going to, going to talk about uh, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm a consultant in the institutes of teaching of surgery, not not Cairo University. I have my MD degree from Cairo University, but I don't work there actually. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Okay. Ahmed. I apologize. I apologize. I, Dr. Uh, really yeah, Dr. Rami is going to talk about uh, <clears throat> coxavara treatment using uh, monolateral uh, external fixator in children. The floor for you, uh, Prof. Dr. Rami. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-mursalin Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Good day, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Rahman al-Harbi for his kind invitation to me to such a nice event. Uh, I would like to thank al-Sharq al awsat uh, events, Middle East events, for their marvelous uh, efforts in organizing such an event. Uh, I would like everybody, I'd like to thank everybody who's attending with us today. Uh, thank you for bearing me for a while. Uh, I would like to talk about some topic called um, Coxavera. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in simple words, uh, coxavera means deformity around the hip in various position, like we see in the legs of some children, what we call uh, uh, various deformity. Uh, it means that the, the, the distal part is moved medially, um, so legs get knocking each other. Uh, we will discuss treating this with monolateral external fixator. This is a new concept. Uh, we have been using for a few years now, but it's not a common concept. So we are trying to make it more familiar to people and we are trying to make diagnosis easier for non-orthopedic personnel so we can get better results and area, earlier intervention with such cases. First of all, coxavera definition, that's a deformity of the hip where the angle formed between the head uh, and neck of the femur, and the shaft is decreased. Uh, most probably it's from 120 to 135 degrees, and it's reduced beyond 120 degrees. Um, this is how it looks. This is the neck shaft angle. This is reduced beyond uh, 120 degrees, so that the, the greater trochanter, if you can see, uh, is high riding. So when the child tries to open his legs in abduction, it gets impinged. The greater trochanter hits the, the pelvis so it, it cannot complete the outside motion of the hip. There is something else called Helen Reiner epiphyseal angle. This is the angle between the, the, the line crossing the epiphysis of or the triradiate cartilage of the pelvis and the epiphyseal plate of the of the of the neck. As you can see on the left side of the patient, this angle is, is pretty much increased compared to the normal angle on the right side. This leads to abnormal mechanical compression of the physial plate, leading to some cases uh, progressive deformity and some cases it leads to slipping of the capital epiphysis itself. Incident, incidents in these cases is pretty much bound to the US uh, statistics. It's one per 20,000, uh, 25,000 live births in the US. Uh, there is no difference between males and females in incidents. Uh, it always present between the age of ambulation and six years of age because it's some kind related to weight bearing. So before weight bearing, we can not notice this pretty much. Uh, laterality or anatomic location, it's bilateral in third of the cases. Uh, the other two thirds 
uh, presents only in one side. With the slight higher uh, incidence in the African races, but there is no exact numbers to support this, this allegation. Risk factors and etiology, uh, there are two kinds, primary and secondary. Primary can be congenital or developmental, can be due to rick rickets. Some cases it, it presents in the adolescent uh, age group, but this is typically not, not the case. Uh, traumatic and inflammatory are considered to be primary because it's, it's happening immediately after the problem. Being secondary here is, is a part of another uh, syndrome like osteogenesis imperfecta or cretinism or dyschondroplasia. Some cases, Paget's disease or osteoporosis in the, the older age group. And there's something called capital coxavara. This is related to the head only with no deformity at the other parts of the proximal femur. Pathophysiology, uh, this means the abnormal physiology of the proximal part of the femur, which leads to progression of the deformity. Uh, the neck femur angle is determined by the amount of growth at the epiphyseal and quadratic portions of the proximal cartilage uh, of the epiphyseal plate. I will zoom it inside a little. As you can see, uh, at early birth or at three weeks, the angle, uh, neck shaft angle is about 150 degrees and it gets reduced by about three degrees every one to two years. Reaching the, the, the minimal number of 120 in the adult age group, actually it's ranging, as we mentioned before, from 120 to 135 degrees. Uh, the abnormal enchondral ossification this is a qualitative uh, issue, not a quantitative issue. That, that means the quality of bone is reduced, leading to weaker bone at this area. The abnormal enchondral ossification results in decreased production of the metaphyseal bone, leading to relative osteoporosis and subsequent weakness in that area. When the child begins to stand up or try to walk, the weight applied to the, to the joint starts to apply pressure to the, to the neck. We, we will perform that like this is the head, neck, and this is the proximal femur. When I try to press it with weight bearing, it starts to decrease with time. So in most cases, this is a progressive deformity due to weakness of the medial part of the proximal femur. Uh, the shear effects uh, causing progressive virus deformity is best understood in relation to the resultant force at the femoral acetabular articulation. This is due to the fact that weight of the, of the man, of, of the human being is transferred through the hip joint from the axial skeleton through this point, the, the, the acetabular femoral articulation. In the case of DCV or developmental coxavera, the more vertical position of the proximal uh, femoral physis increases not only the shear component of the uh, but also net medial compressive forces on the metaphyseal bone of the femoral neck. What does this mean? The epiphyseal plate to start growing or start um, producing bone in the future, it needs to be compressed vertically. When I reduce this angle, the physis, instead of being transverse in the first position, it becomes more vertical. So instead of getting compressed, it gets sheared. So the growth is, is not uh, appropriate and the bone production is not complete. And the head itself is preliminarily can be slipped from its place. The net forces uh, overwhelm the mechanical strength by the abnormality of five bone in this area leading to progressive cycle of deformity. Uh, this is a vicious circle. This is weight bearing causing uh, deformity and deformity causing more uh, effect on the physis, causing more abnormal uh, growth of the, of the physial plate and vice vicious circle. Uh, mechanical stress of the abnormally ossified bone in this area leading to progressive cycle of deformity that continues uh, unless these forces are mechanically corrected. 
mostly surgical intervention will do this. There are slight cases we will discuss later that can go with observation only. As you can see, there are three pictures that the upper two uh, illustrating the normal mechanics around the hip, if we zoomed it a little. The one on the left, you can see the physis, the, the, the physial uh, plate. It's transverse. So when the, when the black arrow goes, this is the, the weight or, or, or the force compressing the, the physis. This is go through normal uh, growth because the neck shaft angle is sufficient enough to perform a transverse position for the physis to grow normally. When we go to the lower part, the neck shaft angle is reduced. So instead of being transverse physis of the proximal part, as you can see here, this is almost vertical. So instead of having compression, the weight bearing causes shearing. It presses this part and especially this part and the inframedial part of the, of the, of the neck. It can lead to, to its destruction and instead of weakness, causing what's called Fairbanks triangle. This part gets separated. I will show you this later. Here, the decreased neck shaft angle, as we mentioned, leads to relatively higher, greater trochanter and altering in direction and the center of forces acting around the hip. We will show back one once more, this slide. Here, the greater trochanter, as we can see, is higher position. When I get into abduction, this will hit the, the, the innominate bone at this part. So it reduces the, the range of motion. Moreover, the abductors are attached right here. So when I reduce this angle, I get a shorter arm of force so the, the abductors get lax. It cannot perform its action in abducting the joint because it's weak and lax. This is mechanically uh, inappropriate. So the range of motion gets reduced with time. We increase the abductor functional demands. In such cases, the abductor muscles tend to, to perform more effort, perform more energy to perform their normal function instead of getting uh, getting weaker. They try to perform more energy. At sometimes this might lead to one of two things. It might lead to some pain or it might lead to just nothing. It performs more energy, but there is no function going on. Clinically, those children are almost asymptomatic. It needs some observation uh, by the mother or the father. All we can see preliminarily is abnormal gait. Um, the child is limping. Uh, there is some difference in the limb lengths between both legs. There is limb length discrepancy. Um, the, the presentation between the age of ambulation and six years. This is the, the quickest part of the development of the proximal femur. So it tends to happen at this uh, particular period because of the, of the early weight bearing and progression of the deformity. So it's obvious more in this time, but after that it can go even to adolescent uh, age group as we mentioned before. In rare cases, uh, the child can come with pain either due to muscular problems or due to arthritis in, in advanced cases. By examination, uh, it's only clinical sense. Uh, we will find weak abductors when we compare uh, to the normal side. This will happen in two thirds of the, of the cases as we mentioned before. There will be a prominent greater trochanter when, when I palpate the patient and, and the low build patient, I will find a prominent greater trochanter and it will be in a higher position than the opposite side, which is mostly normal. With decreased abduction due to two things, 
the impingement happening between the, the greater trochanter because of the abnormal position and the weaker muscles that perform the action. There will be decrease in the internal rotation too. At some cases, there will be decrease in all aspects of the range of motion of the, of the patient, but most probably it will be abduction and internal rotation. For radiological studies, it's enough to perform an X-ray. X-ray will show almost everything we need to see here. We will see decreased neck shaft angle. We have illustrated this in the first slide. Uh, due to lack of compression or lack of mechanical uh, action of the joint, there will be a smaller head and a smaller acetabulum because there is no enough compression to complete the growth uh, of the physial plate. Uh, also, what we call the Helen Reiner epiphyseal angle or the, or the epiphyseal plate angle uh, between the praradiate cartilage and uh, the neck femur uh, epiphyseal uh, angle, this will be increased more than 45 degrees. Normally, it's less than uh, 45, ideally less than 30. Uh, with retroversion, uh, retroversion means uh, that the, 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 the head of the head and neck of the of the femur are retracted to the back. Normally, it's it's advancing and and the anterior and anterior plane about fifteen degrees. It gets retracted. It, it's like this, so it gets retracted like this, reduce, reducing the internal rotation. There is no uh, there is no range for internal rotation, so the patient cannot walk or cannot sit normally. Uh, I forgot to mention, if we zoom this a little, see this little triangle? This is the inframedial part that got destroyed or separated by the continuous pressure of the, of the weight. Over this, we call this Fairbanks triangle. This is, uh, this is not a good sign. Treatment options. Uh, any kind of disease from surgical perspective can take either non-surgical or surgical uh, intervention. For congenital coxavera or developmental coxavera, uh, treatment is contraindicated. I mean surgical treatment from our perspective in case of lack of symptoms. If there is no symptoms, no limping, no nothing, and I saw it on x-ray, I should observe it only. Uh, every six months or every one year, I perform X-ray and measure the angle and compare from the last one if it progressed or not. If there is no symptoms, I won't interfere. If the Helen Reiner epiphyseal angle is more than 45 with no progression, uh, if the Helen Reiner epiphyseal angle is, is about 45, no progression, I can go with observation. If there is no documented progression from 45 to 60 degrees, I will go the same. So I have up to 60 degrees, but provided that there is no clinical symptoms whatsoever on this patient. If there is any kind of symptoms like limping, like pain, like uh, abnormal motion, whatever, I have to go for the second option, which will be the surgical intervention. Uh, surgery should be other cases like clinical limp and Helen Reiner epiphyseal angle more than 60 degrees or clinical limp and Helen Reiner epiphyseal angle of 45 to 60 degrees with documented progression of virus deformity. I have to follow up and I have to intervene early. So if I notice that the angle before 60 is going up at 45 became 47 or 48 and it's going on with follow up, now I have to intervene early to reduce the mechanical load and reduce the destruction that will happen to the, to the acetabulum and femoral head before it goes on some sort of preventive measure. Goals of surgical treatment is, is, is just correction. I have some abnormal things, I have to correct them. This will be correction of the neck shaft angle, correction of the antiversion. This is called multiplanar uh, deformity correction. This will lead to ossification and better healing of the defective inframedial part, triangular fragment I have shown you before, and will lead to reconstruction of the proper tension of the abductor mechanism through replacement of the normal 
of the abnormal uh, uh, mechanics with normal length tension relationship between the abductor muscle and the proximal femur. Surgical options, there is something called epiphysiodesis. This means fixation or stopping the greater trochanter epiphysis from growing up. It's high riding, so it's already grown up. When I stop this, I, I perform reduction for, uh, or lesser chances for impingement and better chance for, for lateral or abduction motion of the hip joint. So in some cases, we need to perform this in slightly high riding, uh, greater trochanter. Other cases, we might not perform this kind of surgery. There is something called osteotomy. I perform an artificial fracture through which I can correct the angles or correct the position of the abnormally placed bone and restore the mechanical forces after it heals. This is subtrochanteric or intratrochanteric osteotomy. Back in the day, we used to perform what's called towel y shaped or langness keeled valgus producing osteotomy. There is much more simple option called transverse brood and osteotomy. And instead of, of performing sophisticated osteotomies that will lead to some result, just transverse osteotomy and perform increasing angle, that's it with the rotation. We call it the rotational valgus producing femoral osteotomy. Simple, very, very long name. For our technique we use, back in the day, uh, people use uh, plates and the screws, uh, other kinds of internal fixation to, to produce such, uh, such correction. But the case is I, I put plates and the screws and then I have to go remove them after one or two years in another surgery. This means more risk, more cost, and more hospital stay. Um, the, the, the kid might get hurt if he's uh, a part of another syndrome or if he's diabetic or whatever debility he might have. So our technique is simply performing less risk. I, I put my fixation from outside so I can go remove it without the need for another surgery. Uh, with less hospital stay, with less bleeding, because I would perform it almost without uh, wounds percutaneously. Okay, uh, so uh, we will perform percutaneous subtrochanteric osteotomy and fixation with monolateral external fixator frame. Monolateral means it's only one side, not, not a circular frame. This will restore the normal alignment and orientation of this portion of the brusimal femur and, and, and poxavera cases restoring the mechanics of the hip joint and the tension uh, of the abductor muscles as we have uh, mentioned before. This is the, the safe corridors for insertion of our external pins. Uh, there is an ideal plane as you can see here. This will go on the anterolateral part. Most of surgeons perform it in the optimal and not the ideal zone because the fixators will interfere with the patient's clothing and the ability to sleep. So we, would, we perform it in a less ideal position, but it's more optimal for the patient lifestyle. This goes for subtrochanteric or the proximal uh, femur like so. Technique simple. Uh, it performed under, the, under general anesthesia in lateral decubitus position. Uh, of course, prepping and draping the, the normal surgical procedure. This is called the half pen. We, we, we get a screw like this and we put it through the bone like, like that. I don't know if you can see that. Like this, this is the bone and the screw goes like. Placing the half pens in the proximal segment with the limb in the hip neutral position avoids the need to extensive skin release around the half pins for corrective osteotomy. This means if I put it obliquely at first and then I go like this, I don't need to cut more skin to get uh, the tension free from the, from the pin I have inserted. I will show you now. We get the first pin like so. This is the pin. I put it in the pre-planned position for uh, correcting the deformity. Like you can see, it's, it's an oblique. Here we need to, to correct maybe about 15 or 20 degrees. So we have put it obliquely like that. 
some people use incisions. I, for myself, pre prefer to, to perform it completely percutaneous. Uh, I thank my professor, Dr. Hassan Berberi, for this. He's uh, the one who taught me that. Uh, this is two centimeter transverse incision that was made at the level of the proposed osteotomy. This one is just subtrochanteric, be below the, the lesser trochanter. Multiple drill holes are made. I, I go drill multiple holes. Then I- Mami, if you, if you allow me, please. Uh, uh, okay. Unfortunately, we are running short of time. And okay. we are heading for uh, Juma prayer, and uh -huh. we uh, have uh, the uh, the next speaker, Doctor Abdurrahman, and, and okay, Professor okay, Nuri. If you allow us, just uh, try to uh, sum up or try to run your slide if quickly as possible, please. Okay, okay. Uh, that's a clinical case um, for a uh, four years of age. Uh, this was right side coxavera with. Helen Reiner, Vizier, angle of 60 degrees, like so. This is the preoperative uh, x-rays. We performed this technique. She's standing uh, on her feet and walking only one week after operation. She can walk. Uh, this is after one month. You can notice that the neck shaft angle is pretty much corrected to 1 .8, 128 degrees. In two months, it's began beginning to heal. At six months, it's almost normal and uh, the kid can walk. And this is the limb length discrepancy. It's pretty much corrected. Uh, you can see the, the, the ankles and feet are the same length. With full range of motion of abduction and internal or external rotation. Uh, thank you. The message I, I want to say in this kind of operation that we can perform simple procedures with uh, with less cost, with less hospital stay and less bleeding. Uh, and instead of conventional procedures, we can perform this. It's easy, it's easy to learn. It's, um, it's almost risk-free. Uh, we can perform this and get better results. Thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for bearing me for those minutes. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Ahmed Al Harbi again for his kind invitation. I hope I was, was I was useful. Uh, any questions? Thanks a lot, uh, Prof. Rami. Really, for your very comprehensive and uh, I really I I gain a lot from your uh, slides. Uh, it's, it's just uh, uh, put me back to those days when I learned my orthopedic and uh, in the undergraduates. But anyhow, it was really uh, enjoy. Uh, if I leave the uh, the uh, the floor for the audience, please. <clears throat> if you have any queries, any remarks, any comments, well, anyhow, thanks a lot, uh, Prof. Rami.